All right, guys. Um, well, welcome to the first. <coughs> I'm not sick. Don't worry. Um, welcome to the first kind of online lecture we're gonna do. I uh, kept it really short today. We're going to wrap up the 1920s. So if you're on Canvas, uh, go to the World War One and 1920s tab. It should say uh, 1920s conclusion. You'll open that PDF up, um, and it'll have let me see, 10 slides. So uh, we're going to walk through the last 10 slides that we were not able to get through last week. Um, we'll talk about that. Today we'll keep it short. Um, so uh, if you'll open those up, um, we left off kind of talking about the DOS plan, production, um, sort of your uh, both your macro and your micro economics and how Things were playing out in the uh, in the Great Depression. We talked about uh, the consumer goods and everything. So we left off talking about assembly lines. Um, one of the most important places you guys can see how assembly lines work is in the production of cars, right? So specifically Fords. So go on to the next slide. Um, it says the Model T at the top, right? Um, industry all over the country... Uh, kind of changes in a time of war. So different uh different factories will make different things for the war effort, right? So at the end of World War One, the factories that made tanks and like some of the trucks that you see during the First World War, if you guys remember back to that movie The Lost Battalion, there's like a time or two you see a truck and yeah. So those same Companies actually switch over and they start making automobiles like civilian automobiles, right? Specifically, Ford. So, uh, we've talked about the economic recession um, that we're in following the war. Automobiles actually are the ones that kind of, like the automobile industry actually pulls us out of that, right? So, Henry Ford, the owner of Ford uh, Motor Company, he um he actually takes the idea of the assembly line and puts it to work for production in the automotive industry, right? So again, like I say on that last little point, to be clear, Ford doesn't invent mass production. He does not invent the assembly line. He just perfects it, right? Um, he makes it work the most efficient way to maximize his profits and maximize production while uh, while still minimizing cost and expense, right? So he takes that assembly line idea and he applies it to his, his car company. So um, let's see. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on to the next slide, uh, slide number three, right? So... The Model T is the first car that kind of becomes available to civilians, right? It's not like your typical like uh, World War One trucks or anything, right? It's just the Model T, right? The first model sells for $850. It sounds pretty inexpensive. Um, back then, that was a lot of money. So, But at the same time, I mean, like, who wouldn't want to pay $850 for a car, right? It's not too bad. It's And it's definitely not like our prices today, right? At your base value, a Model T could steer and it could go and it could stop and that was it it didn't have a roof it didn't have a windshield like it was just wheels and a seat with maybe a few other seats a gas pedal that was it and power no power steering anything right it was the most basic type of vehicle that you could think of like literally more basic than maybe i don't know some of your friends cars right um so first model t sells for 850 and it's so low um, because of the location of Ford's factory, right, in Detroit. The location is right by some of the major industries like glass and oil and rubber. Um, some of the uh, surrounding states like Pennsylvania who are like into major portions of production, right? It's not far away, so the shipping costs are low and everything's kind of centrally located. So your car companies kind of 
come out of this area. This is why they call Detroit Motor City, right? So here's Ford, Ford kind of takes this um, this idea of you know the assembly line, and he's very much kind of reminds me of like Elon Musk today, right? If he can't figure out how to do it or find someone to figure out how to do it, he will find someone to figure out how to do it. So he'll fire everybody until he gets a yes man who will make it happen one way or the other. So Ford goes in, he hires a group of management experts and they improve production techniques. And over time, they kind of assess the way that Ford does business and, um, Look at ways to, again, maximize produ uh, production, minimize costs, right? And Ford is actually not, he's not a bad guy to work for. It's its kind of hard to argue um, that he's a really great employee or a employer. So next slide, slide four. Um, Ford cars are put on assembly line. And again, like we talked about before, you'll have 50 people and one guy will put on tires all day. The other guy will paint, I don't know, the right door all day. And the other guy will put screws into I don't know, whatever part, right, all day. They have one specific job, and that's all they do. So every single part kind of is done by a single person, right? So that sub-question right there, how does this change American laborers, right? We've kind of made mention of this beforehand, uh, but it really hits hard in the 1920s. So if we were in class right now, I would ask this question, right? And I hope you guys are considering it on your own. But it changes American labor because nobody can make a car now start to finish, right? Uh, think about that idea about some of you who were in my class early on. I, uh, I asked a question about if you wanted to buy a gun back in the 1800s, like how did you get it? And somebody made it start to finish, right? We are creating a country of unskilled laborers, right? Nobody can make a single thing start to finish. Even nowadays, right? The the people that we consider to have a skilled labor or a skilled worker, somebody who can do HVAC, somebody who can, uh, I don't know, work on cars, somebody who can weld, that's still, compared to what our laborers used to do, that's still unskilled in some ways um they wouldn't uh the people that we have that we say that have skills now right or a trait um they still can't do anything start to finish they can just do one thing um that a lot of people can't do something like again like welding or working on cars right but you don't have mechanics who can build cars start to finish right you don't have welders who can make steel start to finish right it's still unskilled labor so to answer that sub question, how does it change American labor? It creates a an entire country worth of unskilled workers. All right, so two years later, um, the production time for a single Model T drops down from twelve hours to ninety minutes. So something that used to take half a day now takes an hour and a half, right? Um, and again, we talked about kind of the graph, and I would love to have a whiteboard, but I'm I don't. So I would show you guys, do a little drawing and whatever, and show you guys kind of what your graph would look like in terms of supply and demand and price and all that stuff, right? But don't forget that when your supply goes up, right? So with the with the time, the production time, <clears throat> if you can now do something in an hour and a half that used to take you half of a day, right? You can make more. More production is going to make your supply go up. A larger supply is going to make your price go down. So, again, you see that, and the price drops initially 350 and by 1916, it's down to $290 for a car. Or, excuse me, $350 in 1916, and by 1927, uh, it is $290 for a Model T, right? So, you see that demand and even that ownership go up. In 1919, there's only 10% of Americans that own an automobile. In 1927, over half the country actually owns an automobile. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that, uh, which we will kind of talk about. So go on to your next slide, which is slide number five. Um, now, this is kind of going 
going in more to how Ford uh, does things as an employer. So he, instead of doing the typical capitalist thing, right, where he takes advantage of his workers, he actually doubles his wages from two thirty-five to five dollars a day. Um, he also takes his workday down from nine to eight hours, right? So again, and in an eight-hour work time, you're making what? Uh, four cars, and that's just in one factory. Um, so he's the first major industrial worker to give a weekend, right? So Ford has not only taken the idea of the assembly line and perfected it, revolutionized it, made it work for his thing. He has also now set a standard for employers across the nation, right? Because when you compare this to some of the other um, people we've talked about historically, like your JP Morgans, your Vanderbilts, your Rockefellers, all those people, right? Who wouldn't want to work for Ford? I mean, it might not be the most fulfilling job, but if you're making $5 a day, you're, you're getting your wages doubled compared to your typical American around you. You don't have to have any experience going into it because, again, they're just going to say, hey, right here, here's how you do it. They can teach you your job in a day. Now you have weekends and you're only working eight hours a day. Again, who wouldn't want to work for him? Um, you're guaranteed your weekends as well. So, yeah, that's, I mean, it's just Ford is going to, again, he's, he's setting a standard, right? That concept makes him a wealthy man because he's never going to hurt for people to come and work for him. Who is going to start a strike or a riot because of working conditions, right? Like, he's treating his workers very well. And because of that, you see his his riches go sky high. Um, again, he's beating, if there was any competition, he's beating it around him just like crazy because, I mean, it's $290 or $290 for a car. So, <clears throat> again, Ford is becoming a wealthy man. So, cheap prices... Um, make the auto automobiles more available to people. Um, his, his conditions make him liked not only by people that work for him, but people that don't because they respect it, right? <clears throat> However, here's the thing. Not everybody can still afford a car, right? Even with them being from 850 to 290, you're still, some people are still going to hurt to afford a car. So go to that next slide, number six. Um, so here's how he answers that, right? Uh, it's this idea called consumer credit. Ford proposes that this idea of something called consumer credit, right? Basically, what you do is you're going to buy on installments. So you'll put X amount of money down, and then you'll pay off so much a month until your vehicle is paid off. And if you do buy something this way, instead of paying it for like in cash outright, um, you're going to pay this thing called interest, right? So over time, you're actually going to pay more than a car uh, for your car than you actually like it's than two hundred ninety dollars, right? So you have a little bit of interest on it. If you have ten percent interest on a two hundred ninety dollar car, you're looking at over time you're going to end up paying I think three hundred and well we know I don't do math right three is like three hundred ten three hundred twenty dollars something like that right? Um, so basically again the idea you buy an installment consumers make a small down payment or the, the purchaser makes a small down payment, pays the remaining debt in monthly payments, right? It's just like how we do it today. Um, this is how I'm paying for the car that I just bought, right? I put so much down on it and then I have a car payment every month um, plus the interest of the loan. So this idea actually makes it, a, like makes a product available for Americans that they normally wouldn't be able to own. Um, or they would have to save for years in order to purchase. Um, but this is, again, it's a double-edged sword because that seems really well until people realize that, you know, you can just buy anything this way. Uh, and so they start actually buying things they can't afford, right? Or more stuff than they need. So go to your next slide. Um, so here's what happens, right? Consumer credit. Uh... We're going to enter this thing called a bull market, which is just like fake, right? It's a period of when the stocks rise, makes it look, again, really good on the surface. But people start actually buying stocks with consumer credit. Now, when you buy a car with a consumer credit, you don't, um, when you buy a car with, with credit, right, 
you don't actually own that car. The bank owns the car. Whoever gives you the loan actually owns the car until you pay that loan off, right? So if you think about it, if you're buying stocks on credit, and if you understand what stocks are, stocks are actually partial ownership of a company. So if I bought stock in Apple, let's say I, I buy 10% of the stock of Apple, right? That would be amazing. Um, but I would actually own 10% of Apple as a company. And so I would get actually a say in some of the things they do. Now, that's not always true. But it just depends on how much stock you own in a single company, right? So if people are buying stocks with credit, right, they're buying them on margin, um, nobody actually owns part of that company. Um, so what happens is basically you purchase stock on 10% of what it's worth up front, and then the broker or brokers paid like over time. So when you go to cash that stock out, there's really no money to be had. And one of the things we'll talk about, because we're going to start the depression in the next couple days, I'll post a video for your first lecture for the depression. Um, with that, there is stocks are going to become worth more than their actual company, right? So people are going to own more in stocks than the company is actually worth. So, and again, those last two things, uh, those last two slides are kind of animation. Um, if you're in class, it'd be a lot funnier because they move, but hey, it's PDF, whatever. Um, so yeah, I kind of use that little South Park thing, the sell, sell, sell. That's what everybody does. They start trying to sell their stocks off to make that money. Um, and then that last slide, Basically, what happens is the stock market ends up crashing because people try to sell stocks that aren't actually real, they're not actually owned, and then it's going to lead to this major stock market crash, if you will. So, all right, uh, we'll leave it there. So, that is the end of the 1920s and World War One. So, um, you guys do have a test over this. Uh, I'm still deciding exactly what I want to do, but when I post the announcement for this video, uh, it'll tell you exactly what I expect of you guys. Um, most likely, we're just going to keep it the same way. Hey, you catch a lucky break. Um, don't cheat. I know you're probably going to, but um, it's whatever. Uh, so, yeah, don't don't cheat yourself. Again, if you've done your study guide, you're going to be fine. Because um, I know most of you guys are going to use that to take the test anyway. So, uh, yeah. I'll post with this announcement. I'll post what I expect you guys to do for the end of this unit. Uh, we'll start the depression either tomorrow or I'll either... I might, I might give you guys tomorrow to do the test. We'll see. Let me think about it because, um, again, still trying to feel my way through this whole online thing. So, um, yeah, wash your hands. Um, don't hug anybody. Uh, yeah, don't breathe in any, anybody's air. Uh, yeah, so, all right, cool. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Um, stay up on Canvas. Again, I'm checking your attendance on there for your bell ringer grade. So every day you log in, giving you guys a tick mark for that, and uh, we'll uh, – yeah, we'll conclude it. So have a good one uh, and check back in tomorrow.